Philippa, it's so wonderful to have you with us. Um, we're really, really excited for this project. And um, for the orchestra, I know it's a lot of our first time playing a Rautang and encountering music like this. So is this your first Rautang? Do you want to tell us a bit about... It is. Um, I, during lockdown, um, like a lot of singers, I made a list of dream repertoire that I would like to do. And Evaltung is something of a soprano mountain. Um, it's, it's difficult music, it's vocally demanding, it's dramatically very intense, it's an amazing, amazing piece of music. And I hoped that I would get to do it someday. And then in 2022, Schoenberg came out of copyright. And this year is the centenary of its premiere, so it was premiered in 1924. Mm. And I was lucky enough that I got this opportunity to do it with Lee Reynolds, a conductor I've worked with before, and who's fantastic, and to do it with Southbank Symphonia and to discover it also in this new orchestration, which I think makes it more compact and more immediate, mm. um, and to share it with an audience. I'm, I'm really thrilled to be here. It's a real privilege. Wonderful. And so you've, you've experienced and you've, you've studied this work without the orchestration we're doing this week. Yeah. Um, what, what have you noted so far are sort of the differences um, between the original and this orchestration? And is there anything you particularly enjoy about about doing it this way. This feels perhaps a little bit more chamber mm -hmm. in, uh, in its orchestration. It means that the role of each individual instrument becomes that much more important. So Schoenberg takes Pappenheim's libretto and paints it very descriptively. So when I sing about the moon, for example, you'll hear the harp and you'll hear the celeste um, whenever the woman is being nostalgic or feeling melancholy, you'll often hear a lyrical violin solo or a clarinet solo. And these individual soloistic roles have, I think, increased dramatic importance by virtue of the fact that we have a small orchestra. Mm. And I wonder, so this is famously Schoenberg's sort of first monothematic work. Um, and I'm wondering if there's anything that um, anything in the texture of the orchestral part or your part that gives you a sense of narrative um, in moving this, moving this forward? It's interesting that, that you use the word athematic. I don't think it is athematic. Mm. Um, it is in the sense that you don't have a long lyrical melodic, melodic phrase that comes back again. It's not the same kind of counterpoint as you'd hear in a, a Beethoven symphony, for example. Right. But there are little motifs and little fragments and cells that come back again and again. So, for example, the very first thing I sing at the beginning is I go down a tone and then I come up a semitone. And it's that idea of forward and back. You can hear the fear and the uncertainty immediately. Mm -hmm. And that combination of intervals comes back all over the place throughout the texture. And when I'm singing about the, the, the silver trees that are sparkling in the moonlight, I sing the word And though those intervals are difficult, there's a sort of seventh or whatever, and they sound angular and jagged, if you say it, it follows the inflection of the speech. Mm. Does that make sense? Yeah. So I think there's a... There, Schoenberg has listened to the way you would speak the text and actually set it in a fairly natural way. And the functions that every single response, every instrumental response have all the way through the, the, the piece are crucial. Mm -hmm. And if... Again, to give another example, a motif that comes back. Uh, when the woman is running through the forest, she is afraid. And she sees shadows, what she thinks are crawling. And every time there are shadows, there are demi semiquavers that run through the orchestra. Mm. They're in the bass clarinet. They're in, I think the cellos may have some at some point as well. I hope they do. <laughs> and, uh, and every time there's a shadow, it's... Brrrr. And you can hear it, you know, you can hear it, you can see it in your mind's eye. Mm -hmm. That's what makes this piece so exciting, I think, is that it's painted right in front of you in this kaleidoscopic orchestral tapestry. Mm -hmm. It sounds very much like chamber music on kind of a grander scale and with a lot of intensity. And, That's exactly yeah. what it is. That's exactly what it is. It's, it's a chamber piece, which is unusual for me as an opera singer. Most of the, the roles that I do have 
huge orchestras. Um, the last thing I sang was Lady Macbeth, um, mm. and I've done a lot of Wagner and a lot of Verdi. And, and actually having this much more intimate, but at the same time very intense, interplay with the orchestra and with every single individual musician. It makes, you know, the orchestra in this configuration, in this production performance, the orchestra are as vital a part of the drama as I am. Mm. So although it's a monodrama, I'm the only one who speaks, actually all of you are characters in this drama with me. Yeah, it sounds like there are so many just wonderfully intense and colourful moments. There are. Um, are there any particular bits you like most in this piece? Uh, do you know, yes. Um, the, the, the drama is divided into four scenes, um, but scenes one, two and three combined last eight minutes, and scene four lasts for 22. Mm -hmm. And my favourite bit, I think, is scene three. And it's where we've been through the forest, it's been very scary, and a shaft of moonlight appears. And she stops completely and just stops and says, Da kommt ein Licht, ah, nur der Mond, wie gut. And it's this moment of stillness and ethereal serenity, which is almost one of the only times that happens in the piece. Mm. And it's, it's a little sliver of calm immediately before she sees a, ra a shadow rushing across the floor. But that moment of lyrical beauty is really gorgeous, I think. It's one of my favorite moments in the piece. Mm, wonderful. And this is a really new sort of work for, I think, of course, for the orchestra, mm -hmm. um, for a lot of us at least, but also for a lot of the audience, I think, haven't encountered anything like this before. Mm -hmm. So for audience members who are totally new to this body of work, um, is there anything you recommend listening for? Uh, listening for, certainly. I think we have to remember that Schoenberg, before, he wrote this in 1909. It wasn't premiered until 1924, 15 years later, mm -hmm. but he wrote it in 1909. And immediately before that, his wife, Matilda, had had an affair with an artist, and the artist had sadly taken his own life. And shortly afterwards, Matilda had returned to Schoenberg. And that's the artistic context that mm. Schoenberg is in when he's writing this. Um, a few years earlier, he'd been to see Strauss's Salome. He'd been at the premiere. And actually, there's quite a lot of parallels in the libretto mm. between the character of this woman and the character of Salome, also the character of Electra. A lot of the prose is very similar. A lot of the, the expressions of thought are very similar. And thematically, there's this, when she gets very, very heated and very angry, we go into a six, eight, a compound time where you hear this sort of sweeping, waltzing triplets throughout the orchestra. Dee da da dee da da, that kind of idea. And I think um, it comes from a very Viennese tradition, that aspect of it. And so if we remember that, yes, it feels new and maybe it feels less familiar than these other canonical works, if you view them, through the prism of Puccini, Strauss, Mahler, mm -hmm. all of these composers who are working at the same time. I like to think that Schoenberg, what he's done is taken a mirror to that tradition and smashed it. Mm. So all the pieces are the same. This, the, these colors are the same as they've been, used, they've been used by other composers before, but they've been put together in a different way. Mm -hmm. And what I hope to achieve with the orchestra is to find our way through this musical language and establish what it means for me and for you and how to transmit that to the audience and that's what makes it so, so thrilling i think right amazing so we have these kind of operatic monoliths monoliths like in the room mm. um for people who might be familiar with other contexts of opera but um but haven't experienced something like this before i think so i think so you know and the way i approached it I, i've read an awful lot of research into Evarting because it's, uh, it's a piece that has fascinated musicologists for ever since it was composed. But um, some people have tried to find Wagnerian leitmotifs, some people have said that it's written in D minor, um, which I don't think it is. <laughs> um, there is a bit at the end where, towards the end, where Schoenberg quotes his own previous earlier com composition um, called Am Wegrand, 
and it's a melody that I think is possibly in the cellos, um, if I recall rightly, but it's the bass that's quoted directly from an earlier song. And it's where the woman is taking stock of the situation and she says, a thousand people pass over me and I can't find you. It's incredibly poignant. Mm. And she sings, thousand mansions seen for ever. And at the same time, the, the basses and the cellos are going, dee, ba ba ba, ba ba ba. It's very pungent, it's very, it's very expressive. Mm -hmm. And these expressive tools are the same expressive tools that we find in all music. It's just that they've been <sighs> collaged together in a different order. Mm -hmm. And that's what maybe makes it feel unfamiliar and unsettling. But actually unsettling is what we want from this piece. It's deliberately ambiguous. We don't know who this woman is. We don't know if she has a dead lover. We don't know if, if she does have a dead lover, we don't know if she killed him. We don't know whether this whole thing is happening inside her head. In the original text by Marie Pappenheim, Marie Pappenheim was quite explicit that the woman had killed this man, and she wrote that in the text. Um, the woman in the original text confesses to murdering her lover, and she also is probably drunk because she confesses to having had quite a lot of wine. And Marie Pappenheim, who was a doctor, she writes about, about this woman in a, in a very clinical way, I think, and, and there are a lot of associations with Freud and, uh, and hysteria and these original cases of hysteria as a clinical phenomenon. Schoenberg isn't interested in any of that. And so the things that he takes out make it more ambiguous, more abstract, mm. and actually, I think, more relatable. Because then it, we present this work of art together, the orchestra and me and you, to the audience, and it's up to the audience to decide what they make of it. Mm -hmm. It's up to the orchestra, the soprano, and the audience together yeah. to make it that one thing that day, that performance. Exactly. Yeah. And that one thing, that one day, that performance, that will never be the same again. Right. And that's what's so thrilling about music making and, and performing it with you.